This is Clive, a totally normal student, nothing more, nothing less. Except this pompadour sporting suave guy isn't real, not just because he's a video game character, but because it's just a disguise worn by director Clavel to infiltrate Operation Starfall and get some answers about Team Star's truant behavior. After all, he doesn't just want to expel students willy-nilly, so he takes it upon himself to better understand their circumstances, and that is pretty respectable. Just like he wants to understand his students, I want to understand him. What was Clive doing between each raid, and could he have handled Team Star all on his own had we not been there? Most of you might think that he just went back to the academy, but I believe he did other student things like challenge the gyms and help out his fellow classmates. After all, he was able to fool Cassiopeia into believing he was just a normal student, and there's no way she didn't hack his phone as well to see what he's been doing, especially with how suspicious she was at the beginning. In order to experience Paldea from Clive's perspective, I used his exact team, matching his abilities and moves as they became available throughout the story, and also allowing myself one use of a healing item per battle. No held items, no stat boosters, no switching Pokemon. The bad news was that I had to compromise on the moveset rule since his Oranguru knows Dream Eater, a move that can only be used on a sleeping Pokemon that also restores the user's health. The problem is that Oranguru can only learn Dream Eater through egg moves, and the only parent that could pass down this move is Oranguru. Well, that's not helpful. Basically, it's a move that it could get in previous games from TMs in Sun and Moon or from the Moon Align in Sword and Shield. Long story short, Oranguru is gonna have to learn Psychic instead of Dream Eater for this run. The next thing to decide is which starter Clive would have, since his team composition varies depending on that one Pokemon. Although, now that I look at it, I could've just used Houndoom, Among Us, and Gyarados and ditched the starters altogether. Hindsight 2020. And besides, that means you got to vote on the starter I chose for this run. And just like Giacomo, almost everyone seems to agree that Quaxley was the starter most suited for a Pompadour Companion. Now they can take turns styling each other's hair, but not my hair, apparently this is the Pompadour we get in game, this looks nothing like Clive, oh well. Once the students were let loose under Treasure Hunt, Clive's first order of business was to build up his team in preparation for the first base, so he went down to the Inlet Grotto to catch himself a Houndour, whoops, pressed the wrong button, and after that he went to socialize with the other students to figure out what normal students usually do during the Treasure Hunt, battle, they do battle, though they're not too good at it. But since most of them seem to be going in the direction of the gym, that means Clive would also try to collect all of the gym badges. After all, that's what a totally normal student would do. Now you'd think this would be an easy gym for Clive since he has a fire type Pokemon, but our ember attacks don't one shot, and apparently this Nimbo knows double kick, which is super effective since Houndour is also part dark type. Since we took too much damage on turn 1, it was time to heal up and use two embers to finish off the second bug. That leaves Katie with just her Teddy Ursa, which turned out to be pretty bulky even when hit with a super effective move. Not only that, but it used Fury Cutter, which gets stronger with each consecutive hit, and it's faster than Quagsley, which means we have to rely on Aqua Jet, our speed priority move, to win this battle. We only managed to do enough damage thanks to Quagsley's ability and the double boost to water type moves from Terrastalization. This mechanic really came in clutch. Hopefully it'll also work well against Team Star's cars. Quest. Since one badge alone isn't enough to prove that Clive is just a regular student who somehow went directly to Team Star's closest base, he had to take a detour towards the second gym on the other side of Mesagoza. On his way to Artisan, Clive helped out a fellow student by defeating a giant cloth, which was an easy task thanks to the defense debuff from Houndour and a super effective base boosted Aqua Jet from Quaxley. Just like the Cortando gym leader, Artisan's Brassius also has a disadvantage against fire types, but he isn't as challenging as Katie since his first two Pokemon only know grass type moves. Sudowoodo on the other hand, uh, the other problem is that her newly evolved Quaxo is weak to grass type moves, yet Trulu Voodoo's Trailblaze didn't do much damage to us. Which was a bit surprising because from my experience, Trailblazers tend to be pretty darn strong. But the reason we were able to survive its attacks is because Houndour managed to inflict burn before getting knocked out, and this status condition halves any physical damage the user is dishing out. Trailblaze is a physical move. This gives Quaxwell the opening to attack some more with its basic wing attacks and watches Sudowoodo loses its last bit of health to the flames. Taking on the gyms has been pretty easy for Clive, but he still has a long ways to go before being able to take on Team Star, so he continues to battle more students and teach his Pokemon more powerful moves, while slowly making his way back to Cortando. But once again, instead of going straight toward the Team Star base, he does what any normal curious student would do and climbs up the mountain that's being claimed by this giant bombardier who instantly one-shots our Houndour. Quaxo is barely bulky enough to handle two plucks, but manages to deal just enough damage with its Aqua Jets and a one-time heal to defeat the bird. Having taken down two Titans and two gyms, Clive now felt confident enough to approach the first Team Star base, 
so we face off against the guard at the second base, whose Murkrow is just as powerful as that bombardier, once again leaving the battle in Quaxwell's hands, wings, I don't know what those things are. Having defeated the guard, our next objective is to ring the bell out front to start the raid, except we need to have 3 Pokemon on the team to do the raids, so uh, typically I add Pokemon to the team when they're near the next area we approach, but Clive here has to make an exception to that rule, since I don't want to have something too overleveled, the only option was to go and catch a Sinistee near Zapopico. I guess I could have gone for an Oranguru or Fungus from the Tag Tree Thicket, but that would trigger another Team Star event. Also, you can see some Sinistee at the Academy, also also its stats kinda suck so the fact that it's overleveled won't matter as much. So after this very long tea tour, Clive made his way back to the second base and easily cleared out the raid portion of the invasion. That just left Giacomo, the first of 5 bosses Clive would have to face. He starts the battle with Ponard who easily knocks out Houndor, so it's Quaxwell time. The teacup is there for moral support. The nice thing about Quaxwell is that it knows workup, which will boost its physical and special attacks by one stage each time. And knowing we'll have to slap a car out of the way, I decided to max out these buffs which effectively quadrupled Quaxwell's attack stat. The only downside is that I did have to use up my one time heal to prevent Ponard from knocking us out. And now it's time to drastalize and sweep. My first thought was to go for the fighting type low sweep attack since it's supposed to be super effective, but we didn't even take out half its health. Meanwhile, we were in the yellow. Quaxwell could do another low sweep and then finish off the Starmobile with a speed priority Aqua Jet. I did not use Aqua Jet first because Aqua Jet has a very low base power. With Giacomo defeated, it was time to get some answers. The reason Team Star hadn't gone back to school is because they're waiting on a pal who hasn't talked to any of them for a year and a half and had previously mentioned that they wanted to disband Team Star before they went ghost mode. I think these guys definitely need some education because if someone tells you they want to break up and then doesn't talk to you for over a year, it usually means they aren't coming back. After taking down the dark base, Clive grabbed the TM for Aero Ace near Cartondo and evolved Houndar into Houndoom in hopes that it can be a bit more useful in battle. And then he made his way over to Lavincia for another gym badge. Going base to base is kinda sus, gym first. Houndoom's first battle starts out with it setting up a nasty plot which doubles its special attack stat, but why use it once when we can use it 3 times to max out our offensive stat? Then we can heal up with our one time potion and start to sweep with Incinerate which is a stronger version of Ember. Having one shot everything on Iono's team it was time to face off against her Electric Miss Magius who survived with 1 HP, confused us, landed a critical hit, had us hit ourselves in confusion and then knocked out Houndoom the next turn. And this is why Iono is going to be the first gym leader for Wooloverse Season 2, the story based version of Kinex Become Champion that's coming soon. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already so that you don't miss it. Anyways, since she's only got 1 HP left, Quaxwell could easily finish off the fight with a speed priority Aqua Jet, getting us the third gym badge. This means it's time for Clive to go and raid another Team Star base. Sometimes it's best to just do what's super effective, just like the best way to get some answers is to simply ask. As it turns out, the rumor that Team Star is plotting something against the Academy is completely false, and we even get to learn that the Starmobiles were never used in battle until just now. Maybe that's for the best since these cars are a bit too overpowered. They make Titans like Orthworm feel like child's play. Kofu's gym test was also like child's play, all we had to do was deliver his lost wallet win a bidding contest for some seaweed, oh and I guess we also had to win a battle against this guy, but that was pretty easy thanks to Poltegeist Mega Drain. Sadly, this Pokemon is a phony since I could not evolve it using the chipped pod found right outside of Porto Marinara. Instead, I had to go running around the fields of Cartondo and climb up this mini mountain just to get the cracked pot and needed to evolve it. Now all we had to do was defeat gym leader Kabu, uh, wrong game, Kofu. His first Pokemon is part psychic so we go for bite, but failed to flinch and get knocked out right away. Thankfully, Poltegeist can take care of the fish and Wugtrio with its Mega Drain attack, and since the Wugtrio only uses special attacks on us, we can use this opportunity to set up a bunch of withdrawals to buff up our physical defenses to the max. But why do that when I could've just knocked it out with one more Mega Drain? Well, that's because Poltegeist knows stored power, a psychic type move that deals extra damage for each stat buff the user has, meaning we can instantly deplete most of Krabominable's health in one move, and also be bulky enough to take a powerful hit from Kofu's ace, winning us the battle with ease. I did try this without using the max defense strategy and poor Quaxel could not do anything against a coconut crab. Looks like we might need more Pokemon for our upcoming battles. Good news is we can find those at our next stop. The Tag 3 ticket is home to Oranguru, uh, Zorua, Oranguru, and Fungus, as well as the Poison Team Star Base. But before we jump into challenge Don Atticus, Clive needs to prepare his team a bit, more specifically his Oranguru. Apart from the impossible to get Dream Eater move, Oranguru has another 
egg move, Yawn, which it could learn from several early game Pokemon. Looks like we chose the wrong starter. But there was one specific Pokemon that I thought was most suited for Clive's character. Manchester, the Wooper. Given his previous encounter with Charlos the Shark Cadet, something tells me that Clive would be drawn to a coldly named Wooper that he could get from a trade in Cascarafa. I could have used just a regular old Paldean Wooper to do the trick, but I'm gonna take any excuse I can to include Manchester in a run. So after taking a ridiculously long detour to breed and level up a new Oranguru, who also had the right ability, it was finally time to battle Don Atticus. The strategy here was simple, use Yon to put Skuntank to sleep and also avoid those sucker punches, and then max out our special attack with 3 nasty plots back to back, and then attack with chilling water because a psychic type move would just have no effect here. The river room can also be one shot with a stored power and so can Muck, leaving Atticus with just his Starmobile which also nearly gets one shot with a single stored power. This move is really good. This meant an easy victory for Clive, although it did take a lot of trial and error to find a winning strategy here. For some reason if Oranguru is too low a level, his content won't try to sucker punch us but will poison us first and then try to sucker punch us and that just made this whole strategy impossible to execute. After the battle, Clive gets to learn the Team Star actually protected other students from bullies. They are in fact the good guys here. Also for some reason Don Atticus's friend who does have a name, his name is Yusuf, he doesn't get a little name box when he talks. Poor Yusuf, is he being bullied here? Silly tangents aside, needing to mull over this information, Clive continued to train his team by sparring with various students throughout the region and then proceeded towards Medali to challenge the next gym. Kumala is quick to put a Ranguru to sleep but we go for the chilling water which also lowers the target's physical attack stat. And predicting he would try to sucker punch us, Clive decides to set up nasty plot instead of trying to attack. So once we do wake up, we can just one shot with stored power. Dudan's Sparse comes out to paralyze us with a glare but then goes down right away and that just leaves Staraptor, who is usually pretty powerful and threatening but gets one shot here. Man, this Oranguru is too good. But just in case things start going down south, it's time to catch our last teammate up north, Snover, which conveniently spawns on the way up towards Monte Nevera. The bad news for Rhyme is that her ghost types were easy pickings for Houndoom and Sinistee, which also meant easy experience to level up and evolve Snover. Great! Tusk! That's her next opponent! Something was quite suspicious about this Pokemon, but what's more suspicious is this moveset I've been using for Oranguru. I had to do some drastic changes just to make sure Clive could get through Atticus, but the truth is that Clive's actual Oranguru is not this overpowered. Instead of nasty plot, it's supposed to know reflect, just like Clive reflects on the information he gathers about Team Star. I also had to hunt down some Mimikyu at these abandoned ruins and Sinisty near Zapapico to teach Hex to Among Us. And lastly, I needed some Shuppet scraps to teach Will-O-Wisp to my Poltegeist. However, Shuppet seems to not spawn unless it's nighttime, so I decided to take a long trek over to Alfernada, which wasn't that long at all. And since it was nighttime after my impromptu battle with Nemona, I decided to go catch a cab towards Artisan and farm the Shuppets. And now that I'm all caught up with my TMs like I am with my videos, it was time to return to Alfernada for, uh, but I was just there. Why did it not register as a flight point? <sighs> time to climb the hill all over again. I'm sure glad there's no problems with this game whatsoever. Oh my gosh. Take two. No problems with this game whatsoever. So after limbering up with Dendro, it was time to face off against Tulip, who was a lot tougher than I had expected. Her giraffe palindrome easily took down Oranguru, and Houndoom didn't have much time to set up. But it was enough to finish off the giraffe and Gardevoir. However, her Spathor was more problematic than the Netflix adaptation, mainly because of how bulky it was. Obama Snow had to set up on Aurora Veil just to make it through the fight and finish it off with several ice shards. That left just the psychic Flogress, who is much less of a threat to Poltegeist and its Shadow Balls. Having claimed 7 gym badges, the only gym leader left for Clive to face was Grusha, whose lead Pokemon is a bug type, which brought back some PTSD from the fight with Katie. Oranguru managed to put it to sleep and finish it off with a couple of psychics, but I didn't expect a giant polar bear to attack us with an Aqua Jet. So I set it on fire with a Will-O-Wisp and had a Moonga stall it while the flames drained its HP. Once again, Grusha had a speed priority move to easily finish off my Pokemon and a water type move to counter her own fire type. He's more prepared than I am. My last hope was Obama Snow, who set up a Swagger and then got KO'd because Swagger doubles the foe's attack and it confuses them, but the confusion didn't make them punch themselves, so rip Obama Snow. Hey. 
But hey, at least that means I finally get to use Qualcaval and we spam low kicks to finish off the Titan. And since Grusha is kind enough to turn his flying dragon into pure ice type, we can give it another kick, then finish it off with a super boosted water type aqua step. As the final gym leader, Grusha definitely gave me the most trouble. I sure hope I can remember this for the Elite 4 interview later. For now, we have to take down the false dragon Titan and make our way to the fairy base where Clive meets an unexpected figure. Mr. Harrington, the previous director of Uva Academy. Wait, this isn't Scarlet. So, after taking down Ortega in a very uneventful back and forth battle, it was time to get some actual answers. They used to be a big bully problem at the academy and Team Star formed to scare away the bullies, but it worked too well and every bully dropped out of the academy, causing an unexpected scandal. The big boss of Team Star asked to take all of the blame and was sentenced to 18 months study abroad in Galar which honestly sounds more like a vacation than a punishment. And all the teachers and staff resigned since they were so ashamed of their ignorance. And at that point, Gita probably freaked out and called in Clavel and a bunch of other powerful trainers she knows to take up their current roles at the academy, unaware of what had gone down. Anyways, with this information, Clive now knew who the big boss was and what had to be done to make things right. But first, he had to go and take care of the final Team Star base. In the main game, we actually do see Clive duking it out with Aerie at the front gates, and it seemed like it was a pretty even match, but now we get to see exactly how this match would go down. After I grab a TM for Brick Break and eat a sandwich. I'm not gonna go fight her under level, no thanks. And as expected, Aerie would not go down easily. Her scared Toxic Rogue tries to sucker punches, but that just gives Clive the opening to set up Yawn and a Reflect before one-shotting the frog with Psychic. Lucario uses special attacks that neglect a Reflect and also gets a crit, knocking out poor Ranguru sooner than I would've liked. But that just means Houndoom can blast it away with fire instead. Sadly, this move has low accuracy, so we miss and get one shot with a close combat. With his defenses down, even our scrawny little Pulti guys can finish off Oranguru's alter ego. It could also deal some major damage to Annihilate, which leaves her with just a fighting type Starmobile against Among Us. Quite a defeating Pokemon for Clive. And now I understand why this thing is meta. It can take a punch and recover its own health. The only problem was that Aerie started to stack up gear shifts to boost her attack stat. And and Rev of Room's stamina ability would max out its defenses, meaning if Amoongus goes down, we go down. But even then, the imposter was not ejected and takes down Aerie's car with one last Giga Drain. With every Team Star boss defeated, Cassiopeia reveals herself as the big boss of Team Star and asks Clive to meet her at the schoolyard after dark in a couple of days. To prepare for this ultimate fight, Clive needs to become a champion level trainer, and what better place to do that than at the Elite Four? Now then, uh, which gym game? me the most trouble? I don't know. Neither Rika nor Poppy gave Clive much of a challenge with their matches, Larry was a bit of a hurdle with his powerful star after, but the rest of his team was an even match for Clive. Now Hassel, the art teacher, that guy was trouble. Despite not recognizing his own boss, he knew exactly how to take us down as his back's caliber glaive rushed through all of our team like a thousand degree knife through butter and a bunch of clickbait thumbnails. Leave it to the teacher to make me think. Ok, how's about this? At the onset of battle, we set up Yawn, then go directly for Psychic Spam to knock out the Sleeping and class Noivern. Next, we use Spore to... Next, we use our Effect Spore ability to put Haxorus to sleep, and waste a turn using Spore to try to put a Sleeping Dragon to sleep, and then spam Giga Drain to have enough health once it wakes up. His second Dragon Claw also triggers our ability and then puts him right back to sleep, which means we could spam Hex to finish off the Sleeping and class Haxorus. Man, y'all really need to get some rest at home. Raise a hands, how many of you are watching this like 2am, hmm? Flappo gets taken out with two sludge bombs, and Dragago, which I just learned is supposed to be pronounced Dragauji, I just got lucky on that one and spammed Dark Pulse, which managed to flinch it, then it missed its own attack, and then by the time it did hit us, it was too late for class. And that just left Excalibur, who has a 4.8 GPA and is ranked in the 99th percentile on its SATs, ACTs, and whatever other standardized tests you have to take, so uh, things aren't looking too good for us. But since Glaive Rush makes it take more damage the next turn, that that meant I could try to do some chip damage on this dragon with Sucker Punch and then hope I can hit it with a blizzard. Uh, of course it's gonna crit. Well, time to do the battle all over again. Okay, now that it didn't crit us, Obama Snow launches a powerful blizzard attack that one-shots the nerdy dragon and with this, Clive has now attained the champion rank. Well, technically he did have to fight Gita, but we all know she's a pushover. On his way back to the academy, Clive ran into Nimona who wanted to battle the new champion. And just like in the Nimona video, she loses. Which means it's finally time. Penny leads the battle with Umbreon, which will be a problem for Clive and his Oranguru, so we slowly chip away at its health by putting it to sleep and then spamming Foul Play. Houndoom 
is out next to Fire Blast in hopes of denting its HP and since it is asleep, that means we can actually knock it out. She sends out Vaporeon next and we finally get to use the random Thunder Fang move Houndoom knows only to do minimal damage and get swept. Good thing we have Among Us, but Penny had a counter to her meta mushroom, Fire. Holty Guys does a good job of knocking it out with a Shadow Ball, but then gets paralyzed by Jolteon and couldn't land another hit. We managed to freeze the spiky fox dog thing with Blizzard, Leafeon stood no chance against the Blizzard, and Sylveon got frozen. Oh no, I've fallen in love, now neither of us can move. Eventually Obama Snow did get to attack and finally knocked out the Sylveon. Having defeated and disbanded Team Star, Director Clavel no longer needed his stylish disguise. As an apology for not learning enough about their situations sooner, he chose to allow Team Star to exist. However, they stole school property, made modified Pokemon battle machines which I'm pretty sure are illegal, and then broke a whole bunch of other school rules. So now they'll have to do community service? Man, this game is silly. We already have to do community service to graduate anyways. Joke's on you, Clavel. Although, all's well that ends well. Uh, hi, hello. Can you hear me? Hope you've been well, Clavel. I need to ask you a favor. Can you fetch my copy of the Scarlet Book from my lab at the lighthouse and bring it down to Area Zero for me? Uh, still not sure if you can hear me. Oh well, he'll get the message eventually. Hope to see you soon. Quite the odd message, but since Clavel was done dealing with Team Star for the time being, I guess it's not a problem to run this one last errand. So we spar with Arvin to get the keys, then grab the Scarlet Book and make our way down to the lab at the bottom of Area Zero, where we learn last minute about the time machine and how the professor is already dead and that this AI wants to shut off the time machine, but in order to do so, we're gonna have to beat it in battle. The professor leads with Slitherwing, who nearly one-shots Oranguru, but we live long enough to put it to sleep with Yon then heal up and knock it out with a couple of psychics. Brood Bonnet tries to sucker punch us, but that has not worked on Clive a single time, so goes to sleep as well, but this time we have to spam foul play, which was not doing enough damage, so sadly, Oranguru goes down. Obama Snow is out next to one shot with a blizzard, and then gets one shot with a mystical fire. Altigeist was bulky enough to tank through a shadow ball, but this teapot was not meant to play rough. Screamtail tries to heal up with a drain punch, but we managed to poison it with sludge bomb, and that was all we needed to to turn the tides. Among Us managed to put the Misfortune Sisters to sleep with Spore, then Giga drained them to restore its health and knock them out. That had just left Roaring Moon, who also gets put to sleep with Spore, but this time Giga Drain isn't doing much. Which means it's all down to Qualcavao, who terastalizes and uses Brick Break to finish the fight. Finally, after three character runs, I found a character who can actually defeat the AI professor on their first try. Kinda makes you wonder why they didn't ask Clavel to come help with the whole time machine thing in the first place instead of a random student and the son they haven't talked to for the past two years. Anywho, seems like Clavel is in fact one of the strongest trainers in the region. Stronger than Gita, stronger than Team Star, and stronger than the Professor. And that's probably why he got chosen to be the next director of the Academy. Well that, and also the fact that this man has an immense level of emotional intelligence, a heart of gold, and of course, a very stylish pompadour. I hope you enjoyed watching this run of Pokemon Scarlet. At this point, I've done enough runs to get a good understanding of the game and start working on Season 2 of the Wooliverse, which will basically be more runs of this game, both with a story where a traveling sheep sees if each of the gym leaders could actually become champion, and more. For now, the plan is to just cover the gym leaders. Also, sorry for any delays in the videos, I kinda mentioned it during the run, but I am kind of struggling on the health department, so I'm going at a bit of a slower pace, at least until the doctors can figure out what's wrong with me and I can get back to normal, or at least semi-normal. Even semi-normal sounds nice at this point. Anyways, I appreciate your patience, and I hope to see you in season 2. Thanks for watching, stay healthy, Oh my gosh, please stay healthy and have a great day.